City Lights on location now joins Harrison Ford, Mark Hamill, on the Empire Strikes Back. Did you, how much did you two see of each other when Star Wars finished? We had lunch. One Thursday. Uh, yeah, when was that? Oh, we didn't see each other very much uh, when we were making it. Uh, because our stories are separated in the in the picture. On Empire Strikes On, Back. On Empire Strikes Back. Is that what? No, what I meant was oh. when you finished making Star Wars and all that time of your oh. careers had gone into working with each other, when the film was finished and you finished the publicity tour, stopped in Canada, among other locations. I remember. It's all coming back to me now. What do you remember, Harrison, about Canada? <laughs> oh, God. Pink walls and uh, a green carpet, just like every place else. <laughs> I mean, we, are, we were in hotel rooms most of the time, the way we are here now. Uh, I had very little uh, uh, real experience of, of the, the cities I was in in Canada. I'd like to go back sometime, but I... I what he's in, asking is, do we hate each other's guts off camera? No. We don't? No. Do you thank you, Mark. Oh. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I had heard a rumor that you were actually friends. Yeah, yeah. we are. Now you've blown yeah. that. I don't think it's to the extent that, you know, we party or, or, you know, go over to each other's houses for dinner, but I know that I've asked Harrison for advice at times, and uh, I think vice versa. I mean, he That's right, asked I... my opinion of, uh, of a, whether or not... Uh, Remember when you were asking about whether you should do... The blue pants or the green pants? Yeah, and don't <laughs> wear the brown shoes with he the blue blue. Well, well, let, well, let me well. ask you something, Harrison. Mark, Mark said that he accepted the responsibility of the creation of Luke Skywalker because of what it meant to millions of young people. You said that in terms of your continuing creation of Han Solo, that what you were determined to do with it was keep it simple. I said that. Did you? Well, one one never knows sounds, sounds, what to believe. It, there are quotations okay, around yeah. it. Uh, I, just, I just don't remember talking about the character because I didn't really know what was going to happen in the second picture. I didn't know what was going to happen at all uh, until, I don't I guess it was about a month before we started shooting is when I got the script. Um, I, did, I, uh, I don't think I had a goal. Uh, with it like that, I'm. Uh, I'm. I don't. My mind doesn't organize organize itself that way. I'm more apt to try and find a functional uh, solution to a problem that I that I face than to think that way. I only ask that because if if one can believe the statement that no one ever sets out to make a bad film, yeah. and when one reads a script or an agent makes a deal, you go off to do the job to the best of your ability. When you put all the time and effort you put into a film like Hanover Street, and you read the kind of vitriolic response you must have been aware of toward it, surely you, you worked hard to do what you might have done well in that film. Mm -hmm. When you say Han Solo is a character that you... I have a trick. I never read the vitriolic response to it, and I was out of town while, it, <laughs> while the mobs were still in the streets. <laughs> I, uh, I did six films between the first and the second, and uh, some of them were not as successful as I might have hoped for. But uh, uh, the effort put into it is, uh, I don't think, ever wasted. The experience uh, is always useful. And I think the actor that continues to work will survive occasional, uh, perhaps, mistakes in judgment. All right. Mark, when, when you speak the way you do about Luke Skywalker and the changes in your life because of the near-fatal car accident, well, what, near, what happened? Near-fatal is, again, that's, that's most, much of it is having to do with the way things are built up. It's like playing telephone where you get the message, you tell someone else, you tell someone else, it goes all the way around. By the time it gets back to you, you don't recognize it anymore. What happened was I tried to negotiate three lanes on a deserted freeway in a, B, a brand new BMW, it was about sunset, I guess 6.30 or so. And I broke my nose against the steering wheel. And that's about all, and it was about, it was three years ago. So it was before Star Wars came out. No one was interested then. I don't see why they're so interested now. Are, how do you respond to the industry information that Mel Ferrer is after you for a new production of Peter Pan? Are you interested? 
I was always interested in seeing that story done um, like the book and not like the musical, which is another thing. I don't know whether that's true or not. I, my favorite thing I ever read was that I was going to play Sylvester Stallone's son in the sequel to Fist. And now, I, the, see, those are the kind of things you read that, and, and sometimes it, they're true and sometimes they're not. So I don't know if that is true or not. I want to work, though. Has, has Mal Ferrer been in touch with you or only with Columbus? No, he's never called me as far as I know. Maybe you're supposed to respond to him, Mark, and say, I've just read this in the paper, and yes, I'm interested. Maybe I should. Have you done any writing since that episode of Wheeler Dealers you did? <laughs> Texas, Texas Wheelers? Texas Wheelers. Sorry. Um, no, just letters to my mom, you know. Uh, but that's something that I, I'd really like to pursue. I mean, it, it seems like that might be one of the only alternatives to... Hopefully, I think, in The Empire Strikes Back, you see that I have an ability that people maybe not didn't realize from the first Star Wars. But, uh, again, I'm prepared not to work as much as I hate the inactivity uh, rather than do an all-star disaster movie. You know, unless I'm really strapped for cash. There'll be no Airport 81 for you? <laughs> Not if I can help it. <laughs> Harrison, were you as involved in the physical fitness campaign preparing for Absolutely Empire as Mark not. was no. or <laughs> David Prouse? No, not at all. Why not? Because I, don't, I didn't have to do anything very strenuous, and besides, I have a, an almost pathological aversion to exercise for its own sake. I, uh, I like to work occasionally, but I don't, uh, I'm not a physical fitness uh, freak as much as it's fashionable at the moment. So David Prowse and Mark Hamill just left you out of their dialogues on pecs and biceps and who had gained how many uh, inches that brother. day? Yeah, but see, Dave Prowse has a balcony you could do Shakespeare from. Have you seen those pecs? Uh, you don't get a title for nothing, Mark. Well, I, you know, it was awful. It's that, like that old, why the moron hit himself over the head with a hammer because it felt so good when he stopped. That's the way I looked at weightlifting. It was just a torturous experience. Uh, How about the karate? The karate also very physically, I mean, you're just absolutely spent when, when you're finished. You feel like your lungs are going to burst. My favorite part of the training was the kendo, which is Japanese sword play, but that's really stylized and beautiful. And, uh, it looks as though the way things are going, I mean, the, I don't know much about the third film, Revenge of the Jedi, but I do know that I, in this film I promised Yoda I'd go back and finish my training. I probably should have kept my big mouth shut. <laughs> Maybe there are some people at that high school in Japan that you could really go back and impress with your kendo. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. I went to Yohai. You've really done your homework, haven't you, Brian? How did fatherhood change your life? I mean, you're sitting, you're sitting with an actor and a friend who was a father before all of this began, mm -hmm. but how did fatherhood change your life? Well, first of all, it happened while I was doing the film, so there's a t tremendous split concentration there because your wife needs the sort of attention. And, and, you know, we were going to the Lamaze classes and whatnot, which is sort of considered very avant-garde in England. I was running around the hospital with a stopwatch, timing everything, you know, and we were out, of the, out in the country at uh, um, a, a musician friend's house, and it was in Middlesex, so we had, we had hours to get to London. So out of desperation, we went to this hospital right near his house. It turned out to be National Health, and the lady that ran the floor was like, you know, this short of the Gestapo. And she's, Look, Mr. Hamill, I don't know what you expect from hospitals in America, but put that stopwatch away and stand over there in the corner. And I was like, yes, ma'am. It was really a harrowing experience. Not funny at the time, but uh, you look back on it. So. Nurse Ratchet. <laughs> yeah, it was like Nurse Ratchet. Harrison, I, I want to bring something up with you because of the, the work. You, you made a reference to the six films between Star Wars and Empire. And I think, too, of the achievements as an actor. However small the moment may have been in Apocalypse Now, it was meaningful. But the other one with Coppola was the conversation and the fact that you worked with Gene Hackman. And Gene Hackman said recently in conversation that I had brought up the fact why he had not worked since Superman. Were there no challenges? And Gene Hackman said, oh, there are challenges. I prefer as an actor not to take them. I just wonder, with all the work that you did, did you do six films in as quick succession as you did because you believed in all six of them, or you 
simply wanted to not stop working. Well, I mean, to, to say you believe in a film, I think it's only important to believe in the films, which are uh, films of belief, which are films that are strong in ideal, I, ideas, uh, which may affect people's lives. I don't think uh, some of those films uh, were those kinds of films. I think they were pure entertainments. Then I did them for very, uh, uh, as an actor, I wanted to preserve my career. And uh, it was necessary for me to work uh, for a variety of reasons. And the films that I chose, I chose to demonstrate different capacities. And, uh, and uh, they were films made for different audiences. Uh, Where does Heroes fall into that? Well, film, so Heroes is a very much, that character is very much related to a very strong idea. And I think it's one of, uh, it's one of the things I'm, I most like, that character, that kind of job. Uh, but it, uh, I, it all falls into place. Uh, I think I've had a chance to work enough so that people in the industry think of me in terms not only of Star Wars, which is inevitable, but other characterizations that I have done. If I say Force 10 from Navarone and Robert Shaw, what do you have with you now as a memory of the late Robert Shaw? Uh, my head's full of him. Uh, uh, I don't know how to separate out any one particular thing. He was a great uh, friend. He became, uh, during a short period of time, a great friend. Uh, and uh, it's a shame. Why is it so mysterious that no one knows anything about part three and everyone involved in Empire points out things they didn't know even during the actual production of it? Does it confuse you as an actor who might want to open a script, read his role and begin working on his characterization or is it so much fun? that the actor can approach it as yet another exercise in adventure? Well, you have to preserve that kind of sense of adventure and the fun of it for yourself. It doesn't exist, but you gotta try and preserve the, the illusion of it. The, what's fun for me is good hard work, and that film had plenty of it. A lot of the information is not necessary for your characterization, because your character wouldn't know that was going to happen anyway. Um, I've never been involved in a project of this kind, um, and I was on some talk show saying Jack Lemmon and Hal Linden, and Hal Linden sort of sniffed at the idea that he would never take a, a project where he didn't know what the scripts were going to be. But I don't think he really understood what sort of faith I have in, in George Lucas and, and in his dream, and I'd love to see it realized. And I really feel in Empire Strikes Back the story is only beginning to be told. The first one laid the groundwork and the characters and set up his environment, the, the environment. But uh, now you discover things that you thought you knew um, are untrue, especially the Obi-Wan character who just symbolized purity. And Alec Guinness now, you discover, has lied to my character, possibly for his own gain. And I think that's great because now he's, a, he's sort of a shade of gray. It's not just pure black and white. Let me ask you about something, because there was a tremendous amount of attention given to the fact that George Lucas was not only a brilliant filmmaker, but a generous one, and that the principles involved in Star Wars had gone away with points in the film. There were rumors that each of the principles had become independently wealthy, and that Alec Guinness, with his newfound wealth from Star Wars, was subsidizing half of the unemployed acting community in London. Did you have the same kind of arrangement on Empire? Were there points? Are there points involved for each of you, financially? Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty much a, uh, a common factor of a, of a deal these days. We do have a... But not a for actors, not for unknown actors. Do you know what I mean? You have to have a lot of power. We were unknown in the first film. And that's and we weren't able to negotiate points at that right. point. I wanted so one. So we were given tenth. them. I asked yes. for one tenth of one percent because of all the merchandising, and I wasn't able to get that. But it, I was able to get more as a gift, that which is unusual. All right. 
I thank you. In the meantime, can I borrow five dollars until th Thursday? Do you mind taking it in Canadian funds? <laughs> it's probably stronger than ours. I, I am going to say goodbye. We're looking at a scene from Empire, but just tell me something, each of you. Harrison, when you tour the way you do, and you wake up in yet another hotel room in another city, prepared to discuss the inner meaning of Han Solo. <laughs> What, what has it given you? What have you gotten as a man and an artist? A bad night's sleep, usually. That's it? <laughs> no, I mean, um, what does it give me to do these, uh, these interviews? Yes. It gives, uh, it's like, uh, that, that film is like a baby f for you. and you, wanna, you don't want to set it out in the world unless you know that, you're, that you've prepared. A do you learn anything about you work. by being interviewed constantly? Probably. Probably. Do you, Mark? Oh, yeah. What it's, have you learned about you? Well, I'm in, a pro I'm in the process every day of trying to find out who I am. And I've, I, I, sometimes I think the line between analyst and interviewer gets a little muddled, and I probably talk too much. So <laughs> I've learned to shut up. On that note, we'll, <laughs> we will take a break and have a look at a scene from The Empire Strikes Back. Thank you both. <laughs>